I guess we're talking about pretty big subjects today, freedom and politics and sex. And, and, I've, and I've got a pretty big subject, I think, uh, business. I get, I get quite passionate about business. My wife says I should get a life. It seems to me that it's very easy to take business for granted somehow. How much of what happened today is dependent on small and big businesses? Um, the, the cups we had our tea in and the tea in them, and no doubt the trees were grown, distributed, sold by businesses, unless someone went out with a new forest and chopped them down. Um, our shoes, our phones, I guess I have this wild, crazy vision of business as being a solution, not an obstacle. But what I want to talk about is that business as structured today won't deliver that. So I'm going to start by talking about my sarong. I bought this in, in the northeast of Thailand 25 years ago. I've carried this bit of cloth for 25 years in different parts of the world, and I, and I love it. Somehow it's... Um, I can use it in all sorts of ways. You can, you can uh, use it as a towel. You can use it as a pillow. And if I want that um, David Beckham look, perhaps, it's I can wear as a, as a, as a skirt. Uh, I told you it was bringing the hippie out in me. What can I say? Now, the northeast of Thailand is, is, is the poorest part of Thailand. And um, <clears throat> it rains for three months, not like the New Forest where I live, where right? it rains all the time, as Polly said. Um, and then it's dry for nine months, and they have huge pots to keep water in for nine months. And um, the farmers get so desperate, some of them, they, they sell their daughters to the sex trade in Bangkok. And when I was there, I met some sisters, the, the sisters of the Good Shepherds and nuns, who, who thought, let's try and help in some way. And they set up a business. And they recruit the local businessmen because they found the local women are very good weavers, but they've got no products to, no, no market. So this businessman supplied them better cotton and helped them with their marketing, their products, and um, contacted fair trade organizations around the world. And I bought this sarong in, in that shop. And the business is still going 25 years later. And I find it hard to think of any other solution that could have been quite so effective in, in that particular situation. And more and more people are turning to business, aren't they, as a solution, so government saying, let's make government more business-like. Um, let's make our public services more business-like. Um, and I think that's broadly to be welcomed, but, but there's a dark side to business, isn't there? One thing about business is, if you're successful in business over time, you've got to be focused on efficiency. Um, often that translates into profit, but efficiency is really important. To keep going 25 years, you need that. But if you get too focused on efficiency, you just miss the bigger picture completely. Now, so picture my situation. This is about 10 years ago. My day job is mergers and acquisitions for a huge multinational retailer. At the weekend, I'm reading Satish's magazine, Resurgence. It was doing my head in, I tell you. So, so I'd, Monday to Friday, I'm doing wealth creation. At the weekends, I read Vandana Shiva saying, this creation is built on destruction. And I basically agreed with her. I agreed with, 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 with the big questions being asked in the, in, in the magazine. Um, it seems to me that large businesses are very efficiently running in the wrong direction. So focused are they on profit and growth. And where are the big questions being asked? And I didn't find them being asked within my organization. For a while, I was going around looking for the evil empire. Where are the bad people doing this bad stuff? Um, and I always end up here. If there's an evil empire, I'm part of it. So, I felt, as I said, it was my head in, so I, I felt I had to leave to be able to get some space to think, what's going on here? How do I make sense of this? And I guess there was a question there. Is it possible to, 
to integrate somehow that world of the, 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 the people in Resurgence magazine asking the big questions and actually in charities and wonderful little fair trade companies I've, wor I've, I've worked with subsequently. Really inspiring people doing amazing things. Integrate that with actually this very powerful and effective and you know, I loved it when I first worked with large businesses. It was so, we, we built aircraft engines and all sorts of wonderful things. Um, so, but is it possible to integrate those two worlds? Or do we only have to have this vision of tiny little businesses doing wonderful things but never working at scale? The seven billion of us on the planet, is it really likely that we will never, we will just stick at 20 people or something as businesses and try and network them in some way? But, but, but now I reckon if we were to do that, it wouldn't be business anymore, actually not business as we know it. I suppose I, I start to think of an organisation as a living organism. And what I've found is that these organisms are pretty good at what I call lower-order lower processing, which can be something as complex as building a car and building millions and millions of them efficiently and profitably. Um, but what they're not very good at is, is higher-order processing, which is... How do, I integrate, how do I go beyond just saying, keep my staff happy, keep my investors happy, keep myself happy, keep my um, customers and suppliers? How do I go beyond that and then say, where does this fit into the big picture? Where does this fit in? And businesses just aren't used to doing that. It's so hard, actually, at scale to keep this machine going, of keeping all these different parties satisfied, that to go that extra step is just, is just doing their head in, actually. So they don't even bother most of the time. You get individuals thinking about it. That's, that's my experience. But they, it's almost like the system doesn't allow it space for that conversation because they, there's too much of a hurry to keep the machine going and alive. So what might it be if you... And, and what is happening, though, as I'm seeing, is there is starting to be an integration of these worlds in some maybe smart, small ways. Businesses, for example, starting to bring in other voices into their discussions. So mining companies, 20 years ago, basically ignored their critics, weren't interested in what they had to say. They just do their thing. These days, many of them have what they call stakeholder councils. And before they set up a, a new mine somewhere, in the planning stage, they bring in social and environmental um, critics and say, what should we take into account? We, our customers still want this stuff that we're producing. What should we take into account? B&Q, the, the, the home improvement retailers, set up a youth board, 18 to 20-year-olds who meet the main board once a year and say, we're looking at your business, here's what we're thinking. Um, of course, there's more and more partnerships between charities and businesses um, and, and social enterprises. I mean, that's, there's, there's a real energy there about businesses trying to do social and environmental good through business, fair trade notably. So... But what if you could actually design something that integrated that? So let me talk about River Simple. River Simple is a little, a little business I've been involved with for a few years. Um, our first products will be a car. Well, I say a car. It's hardly a car. It's, it's powered by hydrogen. It's very lightweight, made of carbon composites. It's capable of approximately 300 miles per gallon equivalent. In carbon emission terms, depends on clean hydrogen and various things, but in carbon emission terms, it has the potential to be 30 times less emitting than the Prius. Now, we're not, we're not in production for a couple of years or so. Um, when we are, you won't be able to buy our cars. You'll only be able to lease them because that gives us, as a manufacturer, an incentive to make the cars long as long as possible, use the minimum of, of, of raw stuff. This, this stuff, the minimum, and make it last and reuse it, recycle it. Saves our costs, saves the customer costs, everyone benefits, the planet benefits. But I want to talk about the structure, which is my, my baby, I guess, my passion. We've got no owners. We've got investors, but we also recognise stakeholders. Our starting premise is, if you've got stakeholders, why not give them a stake? Uh, so, we've appointed 
Trustees, or we call them custodians, to speak for customers, staff, suppliers, investors, and neighbours, the community, and the planet. And these custodians jointly appoint the board. So rather than the board being appointed by investors, as is typical, and thinking, my job depends on keeping those guys happy, their job now depends on keeping the community happy. There's a whole load of details about how to get that structure to work and keep, 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 keep all the parties happy. Um, and I could bore about that for hours, but, but now's not the time, I think. Um, I think what's become very clear to me, whether or not our structure is, is the answer, and it's certainly not the, the answer for every business, but we think it's the right for ours, is that we need more experimentation with our structures. The basic legal form for business is the limited company, which hasn't fundamentally changed since 1856. Now, in 156 years, we've split the atom. We've put man on the moon. We've invented, I don't know, 750 different ways of making chocolate biscuits. We haven't changed the fundamental way we organize. And it's a hangover from a, a feudal age. It, it's, it's a master and servant mindset that's gone into that. Or if you, if you prefer, it's a, it's a Newtonian mechanical thing based on control. So shareholders, power, ultimate power to fire or appoint the board, but no responsibility, zilch, zero. A board who are all powerful, by law, they have all the responsibility. So what do we get? No surprise, we get shareholder value is more important than human values of peace and love and trust and compassion. We get a relentless focus on profit and growth with, with disregard to ecological health and human health. And I suppose, thinking about it funnily enough in the last few weeks about my, my nuns, they were wonderful, these characters, Sister Mary, a wonderful lady. She'd been to Cam she spoke Cambodian, if there was a language Cambodian, but she'd been to Cambodia and Vietnam and everywhere. Um, wonderful sense of humour, as these people often do. And she knew she couldn't run a business. So she thought, let's find someone who can. And to me, that's, that's got to be a, an indication of the way we've got to go, is that our, our business people shouldn't be gods. Point them in the right direction, they'll do amazing stuff. They'll make mobile phones like you wouldn't believe. But if they're set in the direction, they haven't got time for that. They're too busy doing, focusing on efficiency. So find a way that the community as a whole, which has to be defined for each business, sets the direction and then point the business people off. And it's in that conversation, just in the same way, it's in that conversation that the magic arrives. If you think about the way we're designed as humans, um, apparently we're pretty good at complex thinking, though our politicians try to disprove this. <laughs> but part of our secret is our left-right brain, complementary functions, interacting. The magic is in, in the interaction. And so if we can find places to have the conversations between business people and people asking the bigger questions, in a selfless way. That's when we'll get businesses who lead the way to a world of, of peace and harmony and love. That's it. <laughs>